you have your Bibles, turn with us to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 1. We want to continue our study here in 1 Peter, chapter number 1. I do want to remind everyone or let you know that uh, Sister Lillian Aiken passed away this week. And today her funeral will be at 2 o'clock next door at Boardwine Funeral Home. And the family will be receiving visitors from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock. That's, again, immediately following our services this morning. And uh, if you know this family, I know that uh, your support for them would be encouraging. And so please be in prayer for the family of Lillian Aiken today. If you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1, stand with us if you're able for the reading of God's Word. I want to read just a couple of verses. I'll try to be quick this morning on the Scripture. I'm not reading a lot of Scripture, but we do want to look at what God has us from this passage. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. Here the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in prayer. God, we ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, for the next moments that are coming, God, we ask, Lord, would your Holy Spirit have liberty in our hearts. God, may you be the one that preaches today. Lord, may you convict the hearts of those who are here who do not know you. Lord, those who have strayed from your word, God, into sin. God, I pray that you would convict them, draw them back to you. Lord, for the saved believer, God, I pray that, Lord, you would encourage them. Lord, may they find hope and strength in Christ. Lord, if there's one here today who does not know you as their personal Savior, God, I pray that you would, Lord, draw them to the cross this morning. Father, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I do want to make one moment of clarification, and that is that I did not have an accident this morning. When I was doing the baptism, my waders overflowed, and so I have water on my pants. I did not have an accident, so I thought I'd have a point of clarification because someone is bound to ask me what happened and so uh, I learned a lesson I will have a spare change of pants for next time so first Peter chapter 1 verse number 3 we see here this morning the scripture is dealing with this thought of I want to bring uh, the message and the thought here the scripture is dealing with a blessed hope again as we looked at last week Peter is writing to the churches here that have been the Christians who have been scattered around They are facing persecution, and they are about to face and endure great persecution. And in that, Peter is trying to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, trying to bring them hope and joy and trying to give them encouragement for the trials that are to come. And here we find that Peter is trying to give them assurance and hope of their heavenly inheritance. Jennifer Arnold was featured in a PBS documentary entitled Through the Eyes of a Dog, and it chronicles her organization, which is involved in training of service dogs and matching them with people in need. The service dogs help people with certain disabilities to do a routine daily task, and, but they also provide something else. Arnold noticed uh, how the dogs and humans bonded, often giving hope. Arnold talks about a young child who told his mother that he didn't want to live anymore. Sometime during the camp that orients and matches the dogs to humans, Arnold noticed that the child's mother was crying. She thought that their organization had failed to provide hope, and in reality, it was the exact opposite. The mother had asked the child if he still wanted to leave and go to heaven, and the boy said, I can't leave my dog. While we know there's going to be great glory in heaven, our hearts still go out to those who have no joy or hope here on earth. What the child found that brought hope, was it the sense of responsibility or, and purpose? Was there unconditional love of the dog? We really don't know. We'd have to ask the child. But it was that that child find purpose and hope that made life worth living. The first thing we see about this blessed hope that Peter begins to write about is that living hope, 
a living hope. He says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. It is a living hope. It is a hope that gives life, that is alive. It is a hope for you and I that is a real tangible hope. Our hope in Jesus Christ, our hope of eternity, is not a hope that we we long for, but it's not reality. There are things that uh, sometimes people hope for, but that just aren't realistic. My My grandfather, he loved the lottery when he was here, and he used to go and buy lottery tickets, and there were times he would buy 100 lottery tickets a night. And in his hope and pursuit of winning something that was uh, unattainable, he spent a fortune trying to win a fortune. Sometimes there are some hopes that are not real, but there are some hopes that are tangible and real, and this is a living hope. We find that it is a hope that is born again, that it is a hope that we have through Jesus Christ. It says, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. That word begotten means to be born again, to have a new life. And Christ is saying, listen, I have begotten you. You have been born again to a new hope. And to the world that does not know Jesus Christ, it's understandable that they do not have hope. See, for those who are without Christ, there is very little hope to be obtained or to be gained. But for those who know Christ, there's great hope. Because we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. We have new life through Jesus Christ, and therefore we have a living hope. Hope that is born again, because you're born again, we find that hope is alive. It is a hope that is not dead. It's a hope that is real. But not only is that hope, it is alive itself. We have a real tangible hope, a hope that is real, that is substantial. But we also find that that hope brings life to those who bear it. Hope that brings life to those who possess it. A little boy went to a grocery uh, grocery store shopping with his mother and he asked his mother, said, Mom, would you please buy some chocolate chip cookies? The mother replied, No, I'm in a hurry. I don't have time. We're not getting chocolate chip cookies. They shopped on down through the aisle, and the little boy a moment later says, Mom, would you please buy me some chocolate chip cookies? He said, No, I'm in a hurry. We're not doing that. I don't have time or money. We're not buying chocolate chip cookies. A moment went by, and the boy began to beg, Please, Mommy, I just want some chocolate chip cookies. Please, would you buy them for me? You know the way kids like to beg. And his mother, becoming irritated, said, Stop, and the more you ask, you're going to be in trouble when we get home. Stop asking for cookies. You're not getting them. They went to the checkout line, and they were standing there in line with people all around them, in front of them, behind them. It was a busy store, and... Right there at the cashier line, waiting for checkout, this boy stood up in the cart, put his hands together, and began to pray out loud. Please, God, you know I want chocolate chip cookies. And you know my mom has been mean and said I could not have any. She didn't have time or money. And God, if you would, please, would you begin to change the heart of my mom so I can get some chocolate chip cookies? The crowd that were around watching that little boy began to almost heckle the mother, saying, why don't you just get that boy some cookies? And, uh, boy, let the Lord answer his prayer. And finally, the mother, in her frustration, went and grabbed the cookies and bought the cookies for her little boy. You know, sometimes many of us in life, we're almost like that boy. Life, our hope, has been tore down, and we almost feel like giving up. Yet for the believer, we should almost imitate that young boy and say, listen, I'm not giving up as long as God is to my Father. There is hope. We're going to pour our heart out to him in prayer. It is a hope that, is, that brings life. It is a hope that springs and wells up within us, knowing that our Father is capable of doing more than we ever dreamed of. And that he has desires for our good. It is a living hope. 
Peter writing to these people said, listen, I want you to know that because of Jesus Christ, because you have been born again, because through the power of Jesus Christ, you have a living hope. And I don't know what you might be facing this morning. And the truth is, every one of us are facing something different. We're all facing different trials. We're all facing different hardships. Each of us are facing things in our life that we do not know the answer to, things that we cannot resolve on our own. And how do we go forward? How do we find the answer? How do we move forward? I want you to know that sometimes when we don't have the answer, all we can know is that we're going to hold on to the fact that we have been born again of incorruptible seed, and we're going to hold on to that living hope that is found in Jesus Christ. He's our living hope. Not only is he our living hope, but we also see that he is our eternal hope. Verse number 4 says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. When Christopher Columbus was sailing to the New World, he hired, uh, his hired sailors were threatening mutiny. The voyage was long and hard, and there was no land in sight for weeks. And one day, Columbus saw an encouraging sign. Floating on the ocean was a small tree branch with the leaves that were still green, indicating that land could not be far away. The green branch gave the sailors enthusiasm and renewed hope. Soon after its discovery, land was sighted from the sailors in the crow's nest. When all seems hopeless, God has a way of surprising us and being present, even in the loneliest of places. It is not God who is absent, but we who have ceased to believe in God and to love him and to hold ourselves dear to him. And so we should learn to cling to God because even in our desperation, even in our loneliness, even upon the waves of the sea, when it feels like land is not near, God is there with us and he is with us. We have an eternal hope that is steadfast and sure. We have a hope that is great enough to help us to continue even when the day seems dark and drear. Even when the circumstances seem insurmountable. It's eternal hope. It's eternal hope that is incorruptible, the Bible says. He said here that it is to an inheritance incorruptible. A man went to a cemetery for a, burial, for a burial. He arrived ahead of the procession as he waited for the arrival of others. He occupied himself with reading the epitaphs engraved upon the stones. He saw one a ways off that called his attention, and as he read it, it said, Death is eternal. He thought this was a most depressing of thoughts to think that death is eternal. However, as he began to move through the cemetery and as he got closer, he found that the other memorials had blocked the view. And what was actually said is, death is eternal life, was the saying. You see, sometimes in our obscurity of our view in life, we look at our circumstances, we look at our surroundings, we look at things that are going on, and sometimes we see a partial view and an obscured view, and we begin to think that death is eternal. But the truth is, we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. We have a hope that is incorruptible. It cannot be defiled because Jesus Christ is our hope, and he cannot be defied. He cannot be corrupted. We have an incorruptible hope. It says, and undefiled. Just as it cannot be corrupted, we also know that our hope is not defiled because our hope is in Jesus Christ. He is our hope. Then we find that our hope is unfading. He said that does not fade away. It's an eternal hope that will never go away because Christ is eternal. See, as people, as humans, it's hard for us, even for me, it's hard to grasp or fathom sometimes the vastness of eternity. 
Tony Evans, in his book of illustrations, put it this way. He said, imagine if we took the Pacific Ocean, which is the greatest body of water on earth, he said, and drained it of all of its water. Then we took sand and began to fill the Pacific Ocean and the, with all of its vastness to the point where the height of the sand reached the summit high of Mount Everest. The number of grains of sand is inconceivable. He said, but then, let's go further and assume that we take a bird that picks up one grain of sand and moves it with its beak, and it's allowed to move every grain of sand, but it's only allowed to move one grain of sand every 100 billion years. When the last grain of sand has been moved, he said, congratulations, you just spent your first second in eternity. That's the vastness of eternity. We have hope that is eternal, that will never fade away. It cannot fade away because Christ in all his glory cannot fade away. <clears throat> That's how wonderful our hope is. And yet sometimes in life and our circumstances, we begin to think that our hope is gone, that there is no hope, that it's too late, there's nothing to hold on to. But I want you to know this morning that, was with, that with Jesus Christ as our Savior, there is hope that is eternal, that never fades away. It does not matter how dark or how bleak it is. It does not matter how late you think God is. I want you to know that we have an unfading hope because of Jesus Christ. As long as he still sits upon his throne, as long as he still reigns supreme over time, space, and all matter, over life itself, as long as Christ still reigns upon his throne, we can hold on to our hope because he is a hope that is unfading. Then lastly, in verse number 5, it says, who are kept by the power of God through faith and salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It says, we're kept by his power. It is a secure hope. It's a secure hope. We had a baptism this morning, and I rejoice with the Lord in that. And it reminded me of just a few years ago, in a bizarre turn of events, the bishop of the Diocese of Phoenix um, ruled that thousands of Catholics would have to be rebaptized. It said that over the history of 20 plus years, that when he was baptizing, instead of saying, I baptize you, he was saying, We baptize you. And they said that implied that the church was baptizing him and not the individual. And so they said that it was a faulty baptism, and they ruled that because of that, those people were not going to heaven. They had to be rebaptized. The truth is, is that, as I expressed earlier, that baptism does not save you, but it does express what's already happened in the heart. Do all the people who are baptized by that priest have to be rebaptized? No. Because our salvation is not in man or works. Rather, it's in Jesus Christ. The truth is that our hope is secure not because of anything we have done to obtain it or preserve it. My hope is secure because Jesus Christ did the work. It's a guarded hope. He says, why? Because it's the power of God. He says, we have been kept by the power of God through our faith. It's through Jesus Christ that our hope is secure. And we can have eternal hope because of Jesus Christ and because what, of what he did on Calvary. Today I'm saved not because of anything that I have done or because I have obtained or earn salvation, not because God is weighing my good deeds and my bad deeds and my good deeds somehow outweigh my bad. That is not why I'm saved. I have a secure hope because it has been kept by the power of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the author of our hope. 
We have security of my hope. I'm not worried about losing my salvation. I'm not worried about hell because the preacher, are you deserving of heaven? No, I am not. But Jesus Christ is worthy. And the sacrifice that he paid on Calvary was fully sufficient to cover my sins. And I hold fast, knowing that my hope is guarded through him. No, is my hope secure because it's been guarded, but also because it's been prepared. It says, the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It's ready. It's been prepared. Jesus Christ has prepared, and my hope, he has made way. Uh, and so my hope is in him because he has made ready my salvation. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you are not sure that if you died today, you would go to heaven, I want you to know that you can be sure because Jesus Christ has made way. He has prepared the way through his giving of his life on Calvary. He's paid the, uh, paid the price. It's a prepared hope. We can have hope through him and him alone. Do you know him today? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And if you do not, I want you to know there is no reason for you to go through life in eternity without Christ. He's paid the price. He sacrificed himself. He's given everything so that you can have a hope and hope eternal. He's prepared the way and paid the price. And simply, it's up to you. Will you give your life to him? Will you place your faith in Jesus Christ? He's done all. And then lastly, it's a future hope. It's secure. He said it's already been prepared and it's ready to be revealed at the last time. The truth is that I have hope and I have hope eternal in Christ. But in this life, I may not see the fullness of that hope. But that's okay. I'm reminded of the song, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures have been uh, laid somewhere beyond the blue. This world is not my home. My hope is not in this life. My hope is in Jesus Christ and eternity. Think of the vastness we said earlier of the oceans and the sands and the vastness of eternity. And what are a few little years in our life? They're but nothing. My hope is eternal. Every head bound, every eye closed, no one looking around. Today, I wonder, I wonder, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know him? Are you sure that if today you were to die, are you sure that you would go to heaven? If you're not, I want you to know that Jesus Christ has done everything for you to know. He gave his life for you. He has paid it all. He's laid his life on Calvary. And he says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, if you're here and you do not know that you're going to spend an eternity with God in heaven, I wonder why wait, why delay, why put it off any further? Today, would you come? Would you fall down before God and say, God, I admit I'm a sinner. God, I know that I'm worthy of hell because of my sin, but God, I place my faith in you. If you're here today and you're a believer, you're a child of God. You're saved. You know that you're going to heaven, but you've lost your hope. Life has thrown you curveballs and caught you off guard. 
and your hope has faded. Today, I want you to know that there's hope in Jesus Christ. As they begin to play, if God has spoke to your heart this morning, would you come and do business with the Lord?